energetic energy expert, political club curator, McCandless Maverick, Ray Linsenmeyer, welcome to the political jungle. That's, uh, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to finally get you in here, Ray. You, you know, we, we, we have people who've been elected, people who've run and, and won, and people who've run and, and lost and then won, but we haven't had people who've run and then not run, and people have run and maybe not had the success that they wanted. So th this is going to be very interesting because you, as the chair of the North Pittsburgh Democratic Volunteer Corps, um, our major political influencer in Western Pennsylvania. And so we want to explain to our audience, who are all interested in how to get into politics, how you got where you are today. And it's been a very interesting, very interesting trail. And so let's start with that. You, you were born in Pittsburgh, McCandless, right? In McCandless. I went to North Allegheny High School, um, about a mile from where I live right now, actually. Uh, I went to North Allegheny, right up in the North Hills. Now, and in high school, what, what kind of things, and uh, clubs and, and uh, activities did you participate in? Uh, I was, um, my big thing was I was in the concert choir. I was concert a tenor, choir. I was a tenor in the concert choir, which was really great. We had a, um, we had a, uh, uh, the director a guy named, was a guy named um, Roland Dahlhoff, uh, who was a little bit legendary now, but I think we had him sort of in the early part of the middle part of his career. Mm -hmm. uh, and just was, was more than more than a teacher, he was a mentor to a lot of us, really taught us about, you know, sort of being adults and being responsible. And it was, it was, it was amazing. And the, and the, uh, the, the group was quite tight and Roland Dahlhoff was, uh, was a real inspiration to all of us. That's fantastic. But, uh, so politics didn't come from there. What was your first political memory? My first political memory actually was, um, was sitting on the couch and watching Ronald Reagan's Morning in America Ah. Uh, that's the first thing I can think about when it comes to, to politics, uh, back when you had a couple hours of convention footage on every night. But mm -hmm. the, the first thing I ever did politically, um, actually, when I was in college, okay. I went to see Michael Dukakis uh, speak at one of the Slavic churches downtown. We yeah, went to, you were at Duquesne. I went to Duquesne, right. and I dragged a couple of my friends down. And, um, and Got there early and got for the front row seats, and that was uh, and put a microphone sort of in his face, and uh, and 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 listened to Mike Dukakis do his uh, do do his speech here in Pittsburgh, and that was the very first thing I ever did politically. The first time I ever got really active uh, was in New Hampshire for Wesley Clark back in 2004. You so you uh, so you didn't really do things politically in high school. No. Um, did, was uh, your dad was a prosecutor? He was a prosecutor. My right. dad went to um he went to law school in his uh, at night in his late 40s, uh, and then became a DA for about 20, 22 years, just mm. recently retired. Uh, loved every minute of it. Now, uh, you, you avoided that path completely. You're not a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. You're a non-lawyer, as they say. I'm a non-lawyer. I'm proud of that. That's good. And, but, uh, but you studied economics and mm -hmm. political science. I did. Right? And, uh, and German. Which, and German. Which was a good tool for you to have in, in uh, getting work after college, right? Actually, it was great. My parents who had never been out of the country, um, they wanted us to speak a foreign language. And so this was back in the, in the 80s, mm -hmm. the late 80s of Pittsburgh. And, uh, and they put me on a plane to go to Germany and work on the shop floor of, um, of uh, Bayer, which is you know, the, the German parent for Bayer Aspirin, mm -hmm. uh, Bayer here in Pittsburgh. And uh, I went to work on the shop floor for, uh, for a summer. Um, and How I old were you then? 19, 18, okay. something like that. Yeah. Did ha, now? How how do you ha, how do you get a job like that? I mean, you're going across the country. Where do you live? Was there a program? Did you have friends the, in buyer? What, what there was a program actually. Uh, there was a work exchange program uh, from from Bear here because this was okay. Bear's U.S. headquarters. Okay. And there was a work exchange program that you know they'd send probably a half a dozen students uh, from Duquesne and Pitt mm -hmm. uh, and CMU over to Leverkusen, which is right outside of Cologne, uh, and uh, and then. Presumably half a students, half a, a dozen students back to Pittsburgh. So that kind of experience must have helped you in getting into Tufts and the Fletcher School, which is really one of the premier uh, business schools, graduate business programs in the country. It got me think. It got me after that. I had the bug. After you go out and you you see a place where the the, the actual givens and the fundamentals aren't the same as what we have, but it works. Mm -hmm. As soon as you recognize that, I remember realizing that one day. You know, cleaning up 
you know, mopping up the floor, actually, thinking that, wait a minute, they do something different here, mm -hmm. and it works. And at that point, I just started paying attention all the time. So I went back to Germany the following year. Um, it was really important. I, I was after, after Duquesne, I went to work in Washington for a while, uh, and, uh, and, and shortly after that, went over to, um, to, to Central Europe. Uh, but it was very, very important. It was the year, of the first time I went over to Germany was the year before the wall came down. Mm -hmm. Then the next time I went over the following year was the year after the wall came down, the, the summer after the wall came down. Yes. So it was really something. I got to spend a little bit of time in, in East Berlin for a few hours um, while it was still East Berlin. So that's interesting. So you, you had sort of a, a, a business background, you had a government background, but how did you get into politics? I always liked it. It was hard because I didn't really know how to get into it either, really. Um, I always felt it was something that would be important to do. Ends up a friend of mine who was working on Wesley Clark's campaign in New Hampshire said, come on up. Uh, and I went up and, and, and helped out for, for a week or so, and it was interesting. And, and What were you doing at that time? Were you working? Did you have a job at that time? Or, uh... I, was in, I was in New York. I had just gotten back to New York and I was looking for a position in New York. Um, there was a, a few months where I was, where I was looking for a position, and that, 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 was, that was the time during the, the Wesley Clark campaign. Okay. But it was great. I mean, that was, it was to, to see the maps and uh, you know, the, the people there. At that time, there was no vote builder or anything. You had a bunch of people around tables with, you know, with real maps. They were right. photocopying and you know, taking highlighters to things, and it was, it struck me as, as, as very organized and with incredibly passionate people on all levels of it. And I drove up and back from, uh, from, from New York to New Hampshire with a bunch of guys in a van, actually. And, that, and just talking to people who had done that before uh, was really quite inspiring. So, um, so again, I got the bug for that. The, the, the next time I was really involved was in the, um, in the, in the OE campaign. I worked um, for Bill Richardson in New York. Bill Richardson, the former governor yes. of Mexico, New Mexico. Yeah. And Bill Richardson was a Fletcher grad. Yeah. Uh, so he went to, so we knew a lot of people in common. He graduated, you know, sometime right. before I did, and he, he was on a board at that time. But, mm -hmm. but we, had, um, we, we had a lot of people in the same circle. Uh, and I thought, you know, I can really, I was running the, the alumni club, actually, at Fletcher in New York at the time. So I realized that, you know, I could really help, out, help him out, and I liked him. Mm -hmm. um, good guy, by the way, Bill Richardson is. And, uh, and and I was able to do a lot of work for him in New York. So it sounds like you would recommend to those who are watching or thinking about hopping onto one of these 16 or 20 presidential campaigns on the Democratic side, that that might be a good uh, uh, leap to, to make. Yeah, here's the thing. You want to make sure if you're, there's always someone that can use your help, right? So you want to have this, you want to make sure that, that you, you, you find the campaign that some sort of the cross section of where you can help the most and who needs your help the most in the way that you want to offer it. And that's not always straightforward, mm -hmm. but campaigns always need people to help, as you know, Steve. They always, I mean, you always have a, um, uh, a deficit of people, right? And so if you prove yourself and you show that you sort of will pay attention to the candidate, you understand the candidate, you can make the case for the candidate, um, the people will want you to keep, keep coming back and back and back. Now, you, uh, you spent a lot of time in Europe, mm -hmm. um, and you were back in, in Washington. At some point, you met your wife, Deborah. I did. We met in Boston. In Boston. In Boston. Okay. The time in Europe is interesting, Steve. I mean, when you look at what's interesting about it politically is that I was there as the wall sort of came down, and then for multiple years, um, between sort of 2006 and, and uh, 1996 and 1999. Right. The, everybody, it was very clear that, that America was a beacon. The reason the wall came down was not because we could bomb them. The wall came down because they wanted to be like us. And all over Central and Eastern Europe, and that was a, an incredible time, you know, in, in, at that time in, in the Czech Republic and Poland and Hungary and Slovakia. I mean, an incredible time mm -hmm. because they all wanted to be like us. And this, and this idea of America as a beacon and our ability to sort of the, to draw people in because of who we are mm 
um, was inspiring to me then, and it's really formed everything I've thought about politics since I, since I left Europe and, w and went back to, and went to Fletcher. Well, that's kind of interesting because you talked about Morning in America with Ronald Reagan. The wall came down. It was President Bush, right? Mm -hmm. And you're, you're a Democrat. Oh, I don't, I, I, the Morning in America, I, I'm not sure I would bring all those things together <laughs> that way. The, um, Morning in America was the first time I ever remember watching anything. I remember okay. watching conventions, yeah. uh, and and I thought they were you know sitting on the couch. And I don't know how old I was, but I was a kid, mm -hmm. right? And I enjoyed the conventions. But the but the wall coming down, I don't I mean I don't see that as a time of George W. Bush. I see sort of that sort of as a time of of America because of who you are. We won, whether it's you know whether it's was you know Bill? I was I was abroad during the Bill Clinton era when everybody wanted to be mm -hmm. wanted to be like us. So it's I mean a succession of American presidents have made and convinced people that this you want to be like us, right? That we 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 can take care of our people. We can put institutions together that you're going to want to follow. Uh, I mean, and uh, I think that's that's something that um, I don't see that as a Republican or Democratic thing. Actually, I see that you know. Presidents on, on on both on both sides. Well, what, what brought you to Pittsburgh? We had a kid. Um, we had been around a lot. I was living in New York because uh, I ran the Energy Finance Group at Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, energy Finance. Energy Finance. Okay. We put big solar, wind, and biomass projects on Army bases. Okay. Which was really fascinating, actually, because it wasn't just everyone thinks of alternative energy as sort of as a democratic mm -hmm. thing, right? And you know. The great thing about that was the Greens clearly loved it. People mm -hmm. on the left clearly loved it. Mm -hmm. But the people that really pushed for it over and over and over again was the military establishment. Interesting. Because they were most concerned about energy security. They were concerned about some terrorist blowing up a transformer on the outskirts of a base. Because these things aren't guarded. You've been to these military bases. Right. I mean, these transformers are just like right off the base, right? And there's nothing that says you can't blow them up. Mm -hmm. So they were very concerned about you know, putting big solar installations or big wind installations if you were out sort of in, in Texas somewhere to make sure that, uh, to make sure that, uh, that if something went down, yeah. you could still do stuff like feed the troops in the mess hall right. and keep the milk cold. I mean, that's the basic stuff they're looking at. If there's no power, you can't keep the milk cold. Well, certainly also if you uh, reduce the reliance on oil in the Middle East, and it makes less yeah. likely we're going to have folks in Kuwait and yeah. elsewhere, right? Yeah. Uh, so you, you, you had a kid, and then you, you, we came, you back. came back to Pittsburgh. We came back. Um, and Pittsburgh obviously grew up here. You know, we have show and tell on this show. Yep. What did you bring to show and tell? I brought, um, I brought a... Um, Speaking of children. Something I actually really like. Uh, my, my daughter made this for me. Uh, she, goes to, she goes to child care. And, uh, and for Father's Day and for Mother's Day, uh, she makes things for her parents and for Christmas and all the other holidays too. But it's got her in her keep somehow. This one yeah. I actually, this one I love. I've had that in the refrigerator and it's one of my favorite things she made me. Um, <laughs> and it just, uh, it's something that, um, that, that they asked her a bunch of questions that she didn't fully understand at that point. She was two years old. And, uh, and now it says my dad keeps books in his pockets. Do you, a, do you have a book I, have, in there? I don't have books in my pockets, okay. actually, but, um, but there are books all around, so it's not surprising. My daddy likes that. to eat pasta with, pasta with sauce and hot dogs. Right. That's great. We have some pizza that our interns ate for lunch. Maybe you can, if you uh, behave. I like pizza. That's great. This is wonderful. Thanks for bringing this uh, in. No, absolutely. Abby's not here today. She's at school. She's at school. Um, that's, uh, that's great. So, so you came back, and what did you do for a living? So we came back. I mean, it was a big decision. Deborah was working in the State Department. Yeah, I was, I, she, I was working at Booz Allen. Deborah was working at the State Allen, Department. Which, were you really working at Booz Allen, or were you a spy? I was really working at Booz Allen. Okay, the, um, all right. The, the, uh, One of the world's most profitable, uh, what, what it's been described as by some, like Bloomberg mm -hmm. says, one of the, the world's most profitable spy organizations because it has spawned, uh, it has people all over the world doing all sorts of very interesting things. My, be a little, I wouldn't characterize it like that. I would, what the interesting thing about Booz Allen was, yeah. though, was that there were people everywhere, right? So if you needed to figure out how something could get through the government or how you needed someone in this group to sort of sign off on something or pay attention to something, mm -hmm. you could do that all internally at Booz Allen. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are clearly people with people that are agencies as well, right? But they would never tell you that. They would just say, like, I go somewhere I can't tell you every day, right? Yeah. So there are definitely people in the spy agencies. Right. But from my point of view, if 
you needed someone to talk to, you know, I was working with the Army. If you needed someone to talk to at Big DOD, you knew someone who could get you in touch with someone at Big DOD. So projects, and it was in the government's obviously, you know, right. their interest that stuff didn't get stalled that they, you know, had paid money for. So we were able to get stuff through. Not just us, though. I mean, Deloitte's the same way. There's a whole bunch of groups out there that can do the same thing in, in, um, within, within, uh, within the government as these big contractors in Washington. But when you, and when you came back, did you have an eye toward, toward actually running for office at that point? I, you know, I was, I had had some discussions. I, when I got back, there had been some discussions around me running for a state rep seat. Yes. And um, in the, uh, in the Pennsylvania 30th, which is Hampton, Shaler, Fox Chapel, O'Hara, and um, uh, Hampton, Shaler, and Richland. Mm -hmm. It was interesting because I had, pre I had just run, I just, uh, I was helping run a, um, I ran a, a state rep campaign uh, in Montgomery County. Uh, where, and I've been doing politics sort of nights and weekends for a long time. And so I thought I knew how to do this. So I, when I got here, they said, you know, you should run against this guy because you sort of know what you're doing. Um, and, and so I went out and got my signatures at all, everything I was supposed to do. But I was st struck the entire time, Steve, by the fact that it was all me. I, I couldn't, at that point, there weren't committee people out there to help. There was no volunteer network. And I kept saying to myself out there getting signatures that if I ever have time to fix this, I know what this should look like, I think. I've been on a bunch of campaigns. I know what it should look like. Um, and if I ever get time to fix it, you know, I will. will. Ends up I had time sooner than I thought because, uh, because I remember this clearly because I got this letter saying, you know, you haven't been back in Pittsburgh long enough. You have to get out of the race. And I went to the party with Where'd it. Where did that letter come from? Uh, I went from? It came from the way it works in practice is the... Um, so you get sued, actually, in practice. The, the opponent, uh, how, English, how English at the time, um, get a couple of Democrat constituents to say, you know, I'm challenging your eligibility to be to run. Um, uh, and I remember going to the party and saying, you know, I have to drop out. And, you know, the senior people at the party were like, that's a law, right? Because no one had been charged for 25 years. And it was a law, and I dropped out because I was, was you know, that's the way it was. But... There was a residence requirement. It was, it was a four-year residence requirement. The same thing sort of Lindsay to. Williams had just right. sort of had the issue with last time yes. around. Okay. It was a four-year residency requirement for state office. Got it. And I've been back for a couple of years, um, which was no harm, no foul, because I never would have understood what the scope of the problem was had I not done that. To me, I think that was one of the, the best things to happen to me, though at the time it was painful because I worked really hard with it. But... In hindsight, one of the best things to happen because I could understand at that point the scope of the problem. And we're talking about, again, north of Pittsburgh, north in of an Pittsburgh. area that is the registration advantage is... It's and had voted. I mean, I, the registration advantage aside, it's, it's, that's more, I mean... There was no registration was no, advantage for Democrats. No, there wasn't. But, yeah. but even though, even the places there was a registration advantage for Democrats, like in Shaler, Republicans won, I mean, every precinct all the time. So it wasn't registration advantage. You know, we just got beat right. constantly. Um, but so I started making a list of you know places where Democrats had an advantage, but there was only Republican mm -hmm. uh, representation. Uh, and went to work on Hillary's campaign every night for 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 months and months and months, five nights a week, six nights a week, months and months and months. And the idea being that we were going to help Hillary win, which we all thought was going to happen, but also I was going to figure out, meet as many people as I could, so when this all sort of went away after we won, mm -hmm. we would be able to build committees out and build a volunteer network. So that when she came for the 2020 re-elect, we had a group of people that could help her out. I remember sitting very clearly, I remember this very clearly, I helped um, set the office up, the Hillary Clinton's for president office in Westview. And the first couple of days, there were three people, me and two women who were, one woman I still know well. and. Um, making phone calls, trying to like sort of dial for dollars, if you will, try to bring volunteers in. Mm -hmm. That was what the state of the party was like for a presidential campaign in 2016, in, in August 16. Um, and so my thought was, we just fix that, right? So I got, I was the sort of the unofficial volunteer coordinator. I talked to a bunch of these people every day, you know, seeing people over and over and over again, training them up, seeing how they were doing, calling them. Still astounding to me, we lost that race. Um, 
And then, as you know, campaigns sort of pick up sticks and leave town. But you, you recruited literally more than 100 people to come and work on this campaign. Uh, Hillary's campaign? Yeah. Actually, no, no, I, no, there was, I helped recruit a bunch of people. That was, you know, she had a, there was a whole bunch of uh, field organizers there making calls. Mm -hmm. I like to think that I was responsible. I helped keep people, right? I made calls, we brought people in, but also we kept people. My view of campaigns has always been this, and this is what I always would tell people on. Look, first of all, there's nothing more fun than going on knocking on doors and talking to your neighbors. <laughs> nothing. In sure, politics, everyone believes that. Actually, anyway. that, no, there, there's nothing, yeah. actually. You don't, yeah. there's nothing, there's no way you're going to be able to learn more about a campaign, about a candidate and how you're going to win than by talking to your neighbors. There's no way. Uh, and so I would tell people, look, I'll go with you if, if you think this would be helpful and you're scared to do it or concerned about doing it. Because a lot of people, it's, it's a little bit nerve-wracking if mm -hmm. you haven't done it before. But my theory of campaigns has always been, look, if you want to come here, anything you want to do, if you want to show up and give us your time, it's incumbent upon me to try to figure out what you can actually do, mm -hmm. to find you something to do. Mm -hmm. And if you approach it like that, and you make every experience where somebody wants to come back, because that's your win, right? And a lot of people come the first time. A lot of people come the second time. Right. But you know how good you are at this if they come back you know, every week for, or every twice a week for, for four months. So you, you built this nucleus of folks who had energy and excitement and passion. I knew who they were. Okay. When the, when the, when the campaign went away at the end, of the end of the campaign, the only person who knew any of the, who these people were was me because I was the only one there like talking to them every week, right? Yeah. And no one knew, no, there was no one else there. So I remember having this sort of thing at my house, our house, um, in December of 16. Yep. And it was mainly to lay out a strategy among 15, 20 people about let's build a permanent campaign infrastructure. Let's worry about, let's, let's spend our time building the committees out, training volunteers, and over a period of eight election cycles, four primaries and four generals over four years, let's just get better at it. Let's figure out who's going to work, who's going to be at the polls, what kind of messages are going to work. Let's get to know our constituents. Let's, one of the things about knocking on doors is you get to know, you have to update the databases in a way that, is, that, that you can't do by making calls. You know if some kid's going to go to college in, in, uh, in, in the fall, so if they need an absentee ballot. You know if there's a for sale sign in the house that you never, ever, ever know just by making yeah. calls. Um, and that was a thought. Let's get eight bites of the apple, you know, four years, and let's figure this out. Um, to my complete surprise, people said, Ray, you should, like, call a meeting and make some phone calls and actually get, you know, a bunch of people. So the next meeting we had 50 people. And this was not odd at the time. There were a whole bunch of groups bringing people in. But we were able to keep 100 and 130 people at meetings, you know, month after month after month. And the benefits of this was... We built an infrastructure then the candidates who would be hesitant to run otherwise said, you know, I feel that there's, you know, in these local races, these state rep, state house races, these, um, these, these state senate races, these school board races, uh, I know there's an infrastructure that will help me. So we had someone who was the first Democrat to run for North Allegheny School Board. Let me ask you, at yeah. this point, had you given a name to this group I had of not people, actually. There, this asset, had not. this political asset? I had not, actually. I had no name at this no point. No name, it was just... 2017. No, it was name. Okay. There, wasn't, there, was, there, was, there wasn't a name to it until probably May okay. or April, as we're like, oh, let's call ourselves a Democratic Volunteer Corps. But up until that, it was just, um, or the DVC, up until that, it was... You know, we just kept throwing a bunch of different acronyms out, trying yep. this, it, and we just call it like our, our volunteer group. Uh, and uh, but it was only until like sort of April May I had a, I had a, a um, one of the one of the volunteers was a uh, was a marketer and a web designer, and she was like, "This is a good logo. You should call yourself. We should call ourselves the, the DVC for Democratic Volunteer Corps." And DVC sounded good, and the logo was great, so we became the DVC. And so what people need to understand is there is a party infrastructure yes. that is formal, political, formed by political boundaries. That's not what this is. This is a political club that's independent, that you formed, and that got people who, who were passionate about staying involved in an area where Democrats had not had success for a very long time. And you put them to work, and you, you maintained it over time, and you did have success. We had a lot of success. And they, Talk and about that. And the great thing was, Steve, is that is that 
we had so much success. And you got paid a lot for this. I uh, got paid, as you know, absolutely nothing for <laughs> this, right? right? This, but this, that wasn't the, uh, that was, I mean, no one got paid for it. We ran on very little money. I mean, I think it may have been we spent $3,000 in 17, almost nothing, because it was all just data and people on the ground who were volunteers. Yeah. The, um, what we were able to do is we were able to put people, cause lot, these, these local races are one on the ground, because mm -hmm. you have such low turnout. Um, and we went out and got people on the ground to, 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 to talk about our candidates. When we won these races, we, we, we had Democrats get through in places they never got through before. All of a sudden, you know, people kept staying involved. Now all the committees up there are almost full or two-thirds full with active people. The committee leadership has changed in a lot of these. And not, not in a bad way, a lot of the committee leadership has said, look, when they recognized there, was, there were people ready to take the helm, yep. they were like, I've been doing this by myself in a room for, for, for or two people in a room for five years, and I'm ready now that there are people to take this over. So now, not only are the committees stronger and the infrastructure stronger, but they're, they're not silent anymore. They've been working with each other for, for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. They know each other, um, and they've worked side by side. So they're, it's a more integrated group. The DVC, though, is not a formal part of the party. We have, we, we have you know, a couple hundred volunteers. Right. Um, so let me ask you this. So usually when we go into the deep dive section of the show, we start with who inspires you. But I want to start with aspiration and work backwards. So in terms of aspirations, what you want to be in, when you grow up, what, the question is why. Why do you do this? Yes, you've run a couple times, but you've also, when it's in the best interest of advancing the causes that are sort of motivating you to run, you've pulled back. What, why, are you, why do you spend the time that you do to, to keep the DVC going? And, Right now, Steve, I mean, it's, it's, I said it's, a sim it's a simple answer to that question. It's the imperative is to win in 2020. That is the absolute imperative. I have a kid, right? We have to win in 2020. Uh, and so the entire, the, the, and I have to be able to tell her I did what I could do, right? The way, the strategy is when you run local races with people, there's, there's fewer people between the candidate and the volunteer. So they're A, very empowered, and B, they know that what they're doing actually you know, makes a difference every day. In a way that if you're working a congressional campaign, it's a little bit, it's a little bit different. You have like you know, a field director, deputy field director, you know, mm -hmm. regional field organizer. So you're working hard, but, but you're not as in touch directly with the actual candidate as you are in the, in, the, in the local races. So the idea is that we build infrastructure and build knowledge and build confidence in the local races. Also because it's lower turnouts, you're normally talking to more friendly people. Mm -hmm. You don't have to persuade people and just turn our friends out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's how they, people learn. And so 17, 18, 19, so by the time that, you know, the, everything's on the, every, everything's to play for in 2020, there is an organized group of people who are, who are strong and who are, who are trained, um, who know their areas, and that, you know, as I told you, there was you know, three people that were, you know, we were in the room of three people, you know, for right. Hillary's campaign. If I had a presidential now that said, you know, I need 100 or 200 people on, on next Wednesday to show up and make phone calls, that is a, that's not a difficult thing to pull off. But here's the thing about the North Hills. Yeah. The, um, one of the success things, too, is that and this was like any school board race. It used to be, for years, my whole lifetime, yep. that if you wanted to be on the NA school board and you were a Democrat, you would, it's happened all, over, all the time, you'd sort of become a Republican, you'd spend a bunch of years in the Republican committee, and then you'd get them to endorse you. We really, I mean, people told us we were crazy running a Democrat in 2017. This year, we had a couple of Republicans in the Republican, on the Republican side who were, uh, who are a little too liberal for the Republicans, so they recruited some people and, and, um, and endorsed everyone except them. Mm -hmm. These guys decided that if they became the Democrats, who they really were and stopped sort of hiding and became the Democrats, um, the Democratic infrastructure in the North Hills could get them through a race, which is absolutely unheard of. Never would have happened. Wouldn't have happened in years. Um, and we got them through primaries 
uh, in a way that you know people really didn't expect, mm -hmm. um, and they're well positioned for the general election. But the idea that people are now becoming Democrats to win races in places like Hampton, where we couldn't do anything, or in Shaler, we have we are now running successful writing campaigns for people. And in, in 2017, somebody wrote a, ran for a write, and now is president of the Hampton Council. We took the Hampton Council over. People know they can go in there, there's an infrastructure to support them. Well, you're having success, which if you had no success, people would be knocking their heads against the wall, but you're having success, mm -hmm. and it's breeding more interest, and it's, it's, it's potentially in a, in a presidential race that where the, the nominee, to win the presidency, you really need to win Pennsylvania. Yeah, but, yes. And but, to win Pennsylvania, you really need to win Pittsburgh and environs. Yes. You're making a difference in that. Right? I'd, argue, I'd argue a little further than that. I actually say that what caught me, the reason that we're, we, we've expanded now and over the last year or so in the Western Pennsylvania, we're now the actual yeah. the Western Pennsylvania Democratic Volunteer okay. Corps. Okay, the Western, Western Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Democratic, Democratic Volunteer Corps. So the, um, what we found going through the 18 races was that, as everyone knows, Hillary Clinton lost by 44,000 votes. Bob Casey, when you look at where Bob Casey got more votes than Hillary Clinton did, he got 30,000 more votes than she did in the 16-county area of Western Pennsylvania that's not Allegheny County. Barack Obama got 20,000 more votes than both of them did. Enough votes exist outside, uh, in, in the 16-county area of Western Pennsylvania to win this race in 2020. I actually, and what caught us looking at the numbers is that Allegheny County is important, but nowhere near sufficient. There's a couple of different schools of this, right? Some people say, you know, you just have to win more in the cities, mm -hmm. and we can turn those 44,000 votes. There's, I don't think there's enough votes in the cities. One of the mistakes that we've made over the years is we don't compete as much as we should in places like Westmoreland and, and, and Mercer and, and sure. Fayette. What I've been doing and what the DVC has been doing is going every night I'm a couple hours away from home pretty much, but, but talking to people and helping to build infrastructure all throughout the area. So when a presidential comes to town, we can say, look, there are people, a strong trained group in Washington County or in Westmoreland County that can help. And what, what we have found, a lot of very energetic people throughout Western Pennsylvania who have not had contact with like either the you know, the party or not have contact with like people to train them sure ever is the western pennsylvania dvc agnostic as to the various candidates running Completely. for the democratic right. well, nomination our, it's so it's not getting behind any per no mayor no. pete or whomever it's just or or biden it just there to help and get turnout our goal is whoever wins in the primary they have to win the general the, is to win in our, 2020 we don't get involved in primaries yep. very much at all. Um, all right, so I want you to answer just two questions. Sure. We, we, I love the conversation, so, but I, there's a couple of things I mm -hmm. want to touch on. I want you to answer in two or three sentences tops. You ready? What, so what, and I think we know the answer to this, but what gets you up in the morning? What's your motivation? We have to win in 2020. Okay. I mean, that's, that's that, I mean, I look at my kid, we have to win in 2020. Moral imperative. If we have no choice. Perspiration, what keeps you up at night? The fact that we might not. And the fact that, the fact that if I, the DVC does a job we're supposed to do, we can, we can move that needle, right? And so we've been in the full sprint since December 2016. We have another year and a half to go. We just have to make sure we push for a year and a half to, make, to do everything we can do. If we do everything we can do, we're going to win this race. All right, we got to play a game because we got we got to we, we always promise we'll uh, lighten it just up just a little okay. bit. But this, thank you for this, and I do have one more serious question for you Good before enough. I let you go today. Good enough. But we're going to start with rapid response. Mm -hmm. We have three categories this week. What would Woody do? Alt turn alt energies, and there's Golden Dem North Hills. Okay. All right, obviously, what would Woody do? Re refers to Woody Allen's famous line, which is. I wouldn't want to be a member of any club that would have me as a member, right? So we're talking about clubs and political clubs. Mm -hmm. And and really the, the the political clubs go back to the 1700s and the French Revolution and the Jacobins and the Breton Versailles group uh, or the Primrose League. So I'm asking you the Jacobins or the Primrose League. 
Now let me tell you that, and you just have to pick, but they had elaborate rituals. They, it was all about rituals and secrecy and titles. Pick one. The Jackmans or the Primrose League? Primrose League. Okay, good. It read, led to the revolution, which was a good thing. Yeah, uh, Carlton Club or Reform Club? I'm not familiar with either one of those. That's uh, like an honest man. Uh, I wasn't either until I prepared for the show. Two clubs from the 1800s in England. The, the Carlton were mostly Tories. The Reform Club were mostly Whigs. Now, what their thing was, was through elegant dinners. And it was more about class than ideology. Obviously, the DVC is not about class. I mean, I'm sure it's a classy organization, but it's not, it, it's anybody. Is it about ide ideology? What is it? What, what drives it? It's not about ideology, actually. I mean, I have said, the interesting thing about the DVC is I have no idea where a lot of the DVC volunteers are. Ideolog ideologically. Some of them, I think, became, Republic became Democrats like after, after the 16 race, and some of them have been lifelong sort of Bernie Sanders supporters. It yeah. doesn't matter. All we're trying to do is go out there and win. So it's actually, actually it's, it's all about organization. You know, race it's is just three things, right? Races yeah. are three things. Identifying your supporters, flipping the ones on the fence, and turning them out. Yes. And that's what we do. Boston Caucus. We're going to the 1760s now, 1789. Uh, Boston Caucus or Tammany Society? I think I have to say Boston Caucus. Well, that's, that's, you met your wife in Boston. I think it's a right. good choice. Now, that was all about, there were all these college-educated folks who had convictions, men and women, who wanted to get involved in politics, but they, and they didn't have a way to do it because the party apparatus was, was, was bringing their people along, and there were people who cared who were outside who wanted to get in. Do you find that here? Do you find a party apparatus that is unwelcoming to the outside? And, and are you operating outside of that? Or are you integrated? How, how, what's the relationship? We're pretty integrated. I actually find the party is very interested. Um, I've, I've worked very arm in arm with the party, uh, I mean, throughout the last couple of cycles. I think there's been a real, there's real, been a real desire on the part of the party to, to find new blood and people that will come in and help. They'd like to build these committees up. They'd, they like to have a, a, a bunch of volunteers that are trained. So, you know, we have made a point. Every piece of data we've ever had, we've ever collected, we've handed off to the party. Uh, remember in 17, uh, we did 11,000 door knocks and voter, voter contact um, attempts. And, you know, getting, I got a call from the executive director of the party saying, hey, can you share that? And by the end of the day, we had it in a CSV file. I mean, the important thing, is that the party has, what happens with this information, as you know, Steve, is it goes to the county party, the state party, the national mm -hmm. party. So it goes into ID so we can see who our people are, who are the people that are most persuadable. Because the most important thing in 2020 is where are these, everyone talks about the, the, the Obama-Trump voters. They're important. The Trump-Casey voters are what wins this race. Mm -hmm. These are people that are out there that have voted for Bob Casey, in Western Pennsylvania. And by the way, these are the same people that I think will, will, will vote for our nominee in Ohio and Wisconsin and Michigan. Mm -hmm. but, but these are people that are on the fence. The problem in a lot of races is you start talking to people like in September, October, right? You don't have enough time to identify who can be persuaded and then persuade them. If we can spend more time figuring that out with the volunteer infrastructure in sort of the April, May, June timeframe, you can figure out who we need to persuade and then get four or five or six touch points on them. The, the, the Trump, me, the Trump, Bob Casey voters are the ones who are gonna win this election for us. Well, you got a lot of them in uh, the North, North Pittsburgh. We got a lot of them in North, we have the, the huge number though. In Westmoreland County, for example, you know, 7,000 of them. Hmm. That's a people look at Westmoreland County and say that's going to be a difficult place for Democrats. And we just there need 40,000 votes and you got 7,000 yeah, 7, of them 7, there. 000. Bohemian Society? or Gertrude Stein. Have to do Gertrude Stein. It's Pride Weekend here in Pittsburgh. Gertrude Stein, we're on the North Shore. You know, she was born around the corner. I do, I do. Uh, 1870s, the Bohemian Society, which still exists today, had people like Richard Nixon, uh, Ronald Reagan, Mark Twain, Charles Schwab, diverse membership over the years. Uh, 
pick one, Bohemian Society, Gertrude Stein. I'd go with the Gertrude Stein Society, even before the explanation. All right, and finally, the, the longest continuous serving political club, independent democratic political club, in certainly in Pennsylvania, if not the world, the 14th Ward Independent Democratic Club or the North Hills Democrat, the North Pittsburgh, Western Pennsylvania Democrat Volunteer Corps. You know, I have a lot of respect for what you guys are doing in, uh, in the 14th Ward. It's amazing, right? And we've modeled a lot of what we do around what you do. So uh, um, I'll take the DVC, but, but you know, we always have an eye for what the, what the 14th Ward is doing. You guys do amazing work down there, obviously. All right, Alt Energies. Because of your, the work mm -hmm. that you've done in energy, we mm -hmm. have to talk about Alt Energy. Wood or whale? Wood. <laughs> Only because, uh, yeah, wood. The whales. The whales. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously, it. right? Whale right, oil. Seriously, right? Wind, waterfall, or wave? Wind. I think, I mean, I, it, it is, we've, we've figured it out. The, the, the lines exist. Um, a lot of the country is now powered by wind already, and it's the, uh, it's, it's the, 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 the thing that we can most easily scale. Solar or geothermal? Solar, for the same reason. I mean, so also you can get a lot more from solar, but no, I think it's solar. There's a lot more, there's a, there's a lot more opportunity for solar energy than there is for geothermal energy. So, uh, clean coal, shale, or nuclear? I like clean coal, actually. Out of those three? Wow, I would never have guessed that. I thought you'd go nuclear. You know, nuclear, I like, look, what I like about clean coal, and one of the things we talked about Booz Allen, we had a contract with Nettle up here, who focuses on clean coal in the South yeah. Hills. And I always liked the idea of people that, you know, grew up in coal, um, they'd be able to transition slowly. Look, I, we, I came from a place that, you know, we got hit really hard with recessions when I was growing up. Um, and I have a lot of sympathy for people who are out there trying to, trying to you know, feed their families. And then all of a sudden say, you know, we're taking your industry away from you. I think nuclear is really important. But, um, uh, and I think there's a future for it. But, I, but to allow these people to transition okay. and to make it so we can keep that. Also, with Nettle being here, that Western Pennsylvania yeah. will be sort of a, a hub for clean coal you know, innovation mm -hmm. throughout the world. And I always thought that was a really good thing. Oh, great political answer. Uh, Alt-right or alt-left, since we're talking about alt-energies? Is there such a thing as the alt-left? Sure there or is. is it I'm, made I'm, up? Actually, I'm, I'm, I, I would like to say neither the alt-right or the alt-left. Neither one of those are, are, are uh, I, don't, I can't embrace either one of those, I don't think. All right, last, last category. There's gold in Dem North Hills, all okay. right? Gurgles or sorgles? Oh, I like sorgles a lot. I love sorgles. Have you taken Abby to Sorgles all yet? All the time. Okay. All the, we go all the time. We go to Sorgles. Nordstrom's or Wexford's General Store Antiques? I go to Ross Park Mall an awful lot. <laughs> and I don't, know how, I don't know how often I shop at Nordstrom, but I'm, I'm, I walk through Nordstrom's all the time. And, I, and we, we, we're quite big fans of Ross Park Mall. All right. Breakout Games or Lumberjacks? You know what Breakout Games is? Breakout Games is in the North Hills. It's like the... Uh, what do you call it, that breakout room, the, the escape room kind of thing. But they have all sorts of games. And Lumberjacks is, is you know. I, I mean, I, I've not or, done so much either one of those, you know. You, you know, need to I, get out. I get, I get, no, you're no <laughs> kidding. I, no, I've, um, Stop knocking on people's doors. No, uh, and uh, I'm not sure what Abby would think of the escape room. But no, we've done the Lumberjacks thing. And I, I enjoy, okay. she enjoys watching the Lumberjack thing, too. So okay. I would have to say Lumberjack, Very I think. Very cool. Deer Creek Winery or La Casa Narcisi Winery? Deer Creek Winery is in McCandless Crossing where we live, yeah. right next door to us and the people that are so nice and so friendly and the wine's nice. So I like them both, but I mean, I have a really soft spot in my heart for Deer Creek just because they're right next door and they're so nice to us all the time. You know, we have a McCandless maven here. We need to ask you these questions. Mm -hmm. Lastly, off the hook, bonefish or red lobster? Oh, I like bonefish. I mean, again, for the same reason. It's right around the corner. Um, and I quite like bonefish. You did great on rapid response, by the way. And I have one last question mm -hmm. for you, a little bit more serious. So um, here's a quote from, here's a, a tweet from Chuck Schumer. Trump's probably bluffing on tariffs. Here's this tweet from Nancy Pelosi. The Senate won't convict on impeachment, end quote. 
And then someone cited these, uh, I can't remember who the, who the, who, whose tweet it was, but they said, perhaps Democratic leaders might do a bit less predicting and a bit more leading. Act for the nation. What do you think about that? You can do a couple different things in politics. You can tell people what they want to hear and you can grandstand. Or you can do the right thing, whatever that is, right? I think we have a lot fewer people out there that are willing to take political hits to do the right thing and, 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 and to not just grandstand. You, um, there has to be more acting. And it can't be done. Right now, right now a lot of this stuff, I think, is done by, from a position of, of fear, on our party and their party, actually, but a position of fear. Um, and I absolutely think, you know, the, I, those two quotes are very different. The, the, the tariff quote, right, is different than the impeachment quote. Very different. The tariff quote is, might be bluffing. Maybe it's bluffing, right? But the impeachment quote that Nancy Pelosi made is an entirely different thing. Mm -hmm. well, what she's saying is we're not going to act because we don't think they're going to mm -hmm. act. Look, here's the thing about this, right? We don't win. If we just impeach the guy, what do we do? We make him into a martyr. The only way we fix America is to beat him on the field. Beat him in 40 states. So we can say, what you have done to this country will not stand. And it's not just a bunch of guys in Congress, or a bunch of people in Congress voting you out or censuring you, which we should do. Right? We should have hearings that people can see this. But I think we hide behind impeachment. The only way we fix this is we beat you on the field so we can say this does not stand. Ray Linsenmeyer, selfless, thoughtful, driven. The Democrats in the North Hills are, and, and whoever runs for president is lucky to have you as a field marshal in this field campaign. Thanks for coming into the Thank political you, jungle. Thank you. Come back. Thank you.